And uh, in that sense, uh, the primary uh, sort of uh, cornucopia-like image. And uh, of course, we have shamanism in there as the sort of uh, masculine aspect of that. Then we have this uh, riverine cultural ecology. So if we say that the, glac the glaciers began to melt about 10,000 BC, they create all the world's river systems as we have them now. The Mississippi River is formed, Niagara Falls comes at, uh, out of this, and you get all these other great river systems. And um, if we sort of skip over the Neolithic, uh, the world of old Europe covered by Maria Gambutis, and we go into the rise of high civilization in Sumer, skipping over that middle Neolithic period, um, we begin to date this right about 3500 BC. And the two primary riverine civilizations then are the Sumerian and the Egyptian. And they both come into being at about the same time. And um, now with each of these next four here, there's like with Spangler, and Thompson's never read Spangler, I asked him. And um, so he's doing this entirely independently, arriving at very similar results. He says each one of these has its own characteristic mathematic, its own char characteristic science, its own characteristic art form, uh, its own characteristic mode of pollution. It, the uh, ecological dimension has come in now. Uh, and what he's trying to do here is to create this idea like Spengler did where um, you don't have this sort of intellectual history of ideas like you have with Rick Tarnas' The Passion of the Western Mind where you just have this ancient medieval modern survey and we say what Plato said, what Aristotle said, what Einstein said. You know, ideas are divorced from their context, from their cultural context. Instead, what he's trying to do is embed these ideas within the cultural contexts that produce them, exactly as Spengler was trying to do, uh, so that we can get a better understanding of these ideas within these cultural, what he calls cultural ecologies, these ecologies of ideas as well as ecology insofar as these things are linked to the environment. So that's why he emphasizes this environmental world here, the riverine culture world for Egypt and Sumer. And so the primary mathematic of, the, uh, of each of these is uh, arithmetic for the arithmetic or the uh, riverine culture. We can also call it sort of the arithmetic culture. The Mediterranean is geometry comes in uh, with the Greeks. The Atlantic is uh, calculus. You can call it dynamical. Thompson calls it dynamical, but it's, it's the calculus. And then chaos theory is the new thing now in the biospheric. Chaos and complexity theory, as it's being called now. So each has its own respective mathematic. But now the mathematic itself that emerges is itself, is itself constitutive of the way in which the world view organizes itself. For example, the arithmetical mentality of the Sumerians is sort of preoccupied with this idea of the genealogies of the gods and how the mystery of the one becomes many. And that leads not only to these kind of cosmogonical creation myths, as in Hesiod's, uh, Hesiod's Theogony, uh, but also to this kind of idea of uh, the creation of nu uh, numeration systems and this sort of memorization of lists. And a lot of this material uh, is very tedious to read because they keep repeating these verses over and over again. They have this sort of arithmetical uh, emphasis on repetition and the memorization of lists. And uh, it's a very hieroglyphic uh, modality also. And the primary form of pollution each one of these has um, is for the riverine, we have salinization of the soil. The sort of soil loss and the destruction of the soil through constantly planting and replanting and ruining the soils uh, kind of leads to an apocalypse that does that civilization in, and the riverine flows out into the Mediterranean. So that in the Mediterranean world of the Greeks, um, and the Mediterranean world of the Greeks goes from 800 BC to about uh, 1500 BC. So it's exactly the same dates uh, that Steiner gives for the geometrical mentality, they sort of did themselves in through deforestation because they were constantly cutting down trees in the Mediterranean to build these ships. So the maritime economy itself was based on sacrificing these forests. And uh, so they had, so each one of these generates its own ecological catastrophe that pushes the civilization into the next sort of mutation that comes out of that uh, climax that's brought about through a catastrophe. And in the Atlantic, uh, you have this sort of you have all of them because the Atlantic is itself a kind of global, atmos based on atmospheric thermodynamical sciences. And you have the primary thing right now is the poisoning of the atmosphere. So you have atmospheric poisoning. Uh, but you also have these others. 
We've taken in salinization, the destruction of topsoils through chemical fertilizers, and we also have the problem of deforestation, which is a big problem because uh, the plants are what will be necessary to cool off the greenhouse effect. If we keep ruining the plants, we've got nothing to check the expansion of these global temperatures. So it's a really crucial problem. And uh, the poisoning of the atmosphere that comes out of the burning of these fossil fuels that came out of this thermodynamical science of, uh, you know, starting with the steam engine and then the miniaturization of the steam engine into the, industri into the internal combustion engine um, and all of that. And then he says there's even a pollution even in this new planetary uh, theory, which is uh, noise, noise pollution. And by noise, it doesn't just mean sound. He means pollution in the sense of electronic noise everywhere. The primary uh, technology in the processual is electronic. Whereas in the Atlantic, the primary uh, technology had been print-based. And uh, it was hieroglyphic, as we've said, in the uh, rivering. And then alphabetic with the Greeks. So you move from the primary mode of communication, a la McLuhan, moves from hieroglyphic script to the alphabet to, with the creation of the printing press in 1453, the dissemination of the book and uh, the idea of the sort of Gutenberg galaxy where uh, reality is a text and uh, what you can know about reality is based on what you can read out of a textbook or out of any book for that matter, any text whatsoever. But now the primary uh, mode of technology uh, for communication here is electronic, but the electronic generates this constant noise, this constant background noise. Um, so then we have now, uh, so that gives you the sense of these, each one of these is a kind of ecology we want to sort of look at the history of literature that he sort of situates within each one of these. He has, um, he's, he's got this triadic rhythm where you have in each one of these cultures formative texts that then give rise to dominant texts that then move into climactic texts, which push the motif as far as it can possibly go and until and uh, it can flip over into a new mentality. Um, so we have this sort of rivering texts. The formative texts of the rivering culture of the ancient Sumer are the love songs of Inanna and Demutsi. Now Inanna, patriarchy has its, its crystallizing, it's slowly settling in, but uh, the Sumerians have still a very great respect for the goddess world. Even though they're domesticating the goddess, they're miniaturizing her down and scaling her down, the primary goddess at this time is Inanna, who's later Ishtar, and later becomes Venus, and uh, is associated with the planet Venus. Um, she was originally a grain goddess like Ceres, but uh, then she became, because she's always associated with storehouses, and one of her symbols is the storehouse for the grain. Uh, and, but then she became associated with the, the cycles of the planet Venus. But in the early love poems, her early lover is Demuzi, this wimpy sort of shepherd god. She's the charismatic figure in all these early texts because she's doing things like, uh, she sort of goes to her father Enki, and Enki is this Sumerian god who has created the Tigris and Euphrates rivers through masturbating. And every time you see him, uh, there's, there's some jar or vein, the Sumerians were really fond of visual puns. They hid their sexual metaphors in these visual puns so that you get them, for example, if you look at these Sumerian cylinder seals, you always see these gods seated elegantly in these little thrones wearing these hats that are sort of built up out of combinations of bull horns, but the bull horns are so tightly put together that it begins to look like the head of the penis. And these, these are absolutely intentional pictorial allegories that the king will normally be wearing. If you look at the sort of uh, in a very late version where you have King Gudea of Lagash, who was a historical personality, he takes over all the iconography associated with the god Enki. So you can see this. And he'll often be holding like this vase, looks like a vase with a spout, and two rivers will be pouring out of it. And that's, of course, the penis and the testicles and the semen, because the same word in Sumerian doubles for semen and for water. So we have all these deliberate puns. And that uh, leads us to the idea, the primary idea that the spirituality of the Sumerian civilization is imminent.